Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this month's Interior Museum Lunchtime Lecture Series. Uh, we are going to be highlighting some of the work of the U.S. Geological Survey today. I am uh, very pleased to be welcoming Dr. Lynn uh, Wingard. She comes to us from the Eastern Geology and Paleoclimate Science Center, uh, where she is a research geologist and the project chief. Uh, she has been working with the South Florida ecosystems in restoration for nearly 20 years. So she um, she has a long history in that subject matter, uh, having a BS from um, uh, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, that uh, bachelor's of science in geology and biology, um, a master's of science and PhD also in geology uh, from the uh, George Washington University here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so please do welcome uh, Dr. Lynn Wingard. Thank you, Diana. I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm really happy to be here because I was one of those people traveling on Monday and was beginning to think I wouldn't make it back here to, to give this presentation. And I was, in fact, in South Florida. So thank you all for making it. Um, I wanted today to kind of give you a little bit of background in how paleoecology, which people usually think of as something where you're looking really far in the past, how it's being applied to ecosystem problems in today's world and specifically restoration issues using the Everglades as an example. And there's a number of organizations that are involved in this research that I have to thank. Um, and it's, it's a lot of Department of Interior agencies, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, um, NOAA is also involved, Army Corps of Engineers, South Florida Water Management District, and a number of other state and private organizations. And the work I'll be showing involves a lot of people at the USGS, so I have to thank all of them, but I won't go through and name everybody. <laughs> So when we talk about the greater Everglades ecosystem, um, just to kind of get you oriented, so we have Miami and Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach forming this urban system over here, Lake Okeechobee up here, which is the source waters in terms of what flows southward, but Lake Okeechobee is fed by the Kissimmee River Basin, which is up off the map here, Everglades agricultural area, these water conservation areas, and then we have Everglades National Park, which includes Florida Bay, Big Cypress National Preserve, and over here, Biscayne National Park, and the 10,000 Islands uh, National Wildlife Refuges. So we'll be seeing more of this. But when we talk about the Everglades, some of the sort of defining characteristics of the Everglades, it's a river of grass, you've probably heard that term many times and you'll hear it again today, that averages about 50 miles wide through this stretch here. And typically it averages just about six inches deep for the water. And it's considered a unique wetland that sits right on the boundary of the subtropical and tropical environments. And at its highest point, it's only eight feet above sea level. So water is definitely a feature that we see. But when we talk about restoring the Everglades ecosystem, we have to take into account all of the built system that exists. So again, we have this urban area on the east coast that goes from West Palm Beach down to uh, Florida City and Homestead, and encompassing Fort Lauderdale and Miami. And then over in the Port Charlotte area, we have Fort Myers. So both of these urban areas are very much part of the greater Everglades ecosystem. And South Florida has seen a 36% increase in population over the last two decades. So they're having to accommodate the water needs of the population, as well as agriculture. Um, and this is, as I said a few minutes ago, the Everglades Agricultural District just south of Lake Okeechobee here. And a lot of people nationwide, I don't think, think of Florida as being a big producer of um, crops, but they're responsible for 20% of the nation's fresh vegetables. And in the wintertime, those odds go up. Um, it ranks fourth nationwide for crop production, and it's a $20 billion impact on South Florida as of 2010 statistics. There are also tribal lands in South Florida. Uh, the Miccosukee Seminole lands cover about 90,000 acres, most of them focused right in this area here, and then there's like a little urban headquarters area over here. 
And then there is the wilderness. And what is unusual here is that the wilderness backs right up to this urban area. There are over 4,000 square miles of federally protected land in South Florida. And that's not including the marine protected areas, <clears throat> which constitute more than 4,600 square miles. So we have Biscayne National Park over here. This is part of Everglades National Park on the southwest coast here and the 10,000 Islands Wildlife Refuge and then the Keys Marine Sanctuary, which is operated by NOAA. And if we were, to, the map went out further, the Dry Tortugas is out here. So I think it was probably Marjorie Stoneman Douglas that first brought the Everglades to national attention with some of her very eloquent descriptions of what the Everglades are like when she published the Everglades River of Grass. And she's probably the one that first kind of used that moniker and made it very popular. Um, I want to first focus on the uniqueness of the Everglades and her words that there are no other Everglades in the world. There really aren't. The only other things that come close are the Pantanal in South America and the Okavanga in Africa. So first, we have a number of legal mandates that we have to consider when we're talking about restoring the Everglades. As I said a few minutes ago, it's over 4,000 square miles of federal land down there. Everglades National Park is the third largest national park in the lower 48 states. And there are 12 national wildlife refuges that are part of the greater Everglades ecosystem. And in addition, it has international recognition. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, an international biosphere reserve, and a wetland of international importance. So we have to take all of that into consideration when we're talking about restoring. There are also a number of threatened and endangered species in South Florida. 16 species on the federal endangered list and seven on the threatened. And then if we look at the state numbers, they have 51 endangered state species and 17 threatened. It also encompasses a number of sort of unique ecosystems for the United States. It's the largest continuous stand of sawgrass prairie in all of North America. It's a 150 mile reef track extending from Biscayne southward to the Keys and the Dry Tortugas. And that's the most extensive living reef in the continental United States. And it also has 500 square miles of mangroves. Some people say that that's the actual largest continuous stretch of mangroves in the world. Um, so that is the component that goes down around the southwest coast. And most of that is within um, Everglades National Park. It's also very unique in terms of the biodiversity. There's a mix of Caribbean and temperate plants and animals that go from the, the <clears throat> North America's smallest um, amphibian, this tiny little oak toad frog, to the largest North American reptile, the American crocodiles, which are found only in South Florida. There are over 350 species of birds, 300 species of freshwater and marine fish, 40 species of mammals, 50 species of reptiles, and over 1,000 species of plants, including 25 that are rare orchids. And then finally, there's, there's the part, the economic value. What does the Everglades ecosystem bring to South Florida and to the nation? And it has tremendous aesthetic and recreational value, which is kind of hard to put a dollar sign on. But it is definitely a draw for tourists and for commercial and recreational fishing. And that's both saltwater and freshwater fishing. So how did we get to the point where we need to be restoring the Everglades and worrying about all of these different mandates that we have to protect? This drawing was done by a colleague of mine at South Florida Water Management District and where he simulated a satellite image of what the Everglades would have looked like around the beginning of the 20th century. And so we see the Lake Okeechobee here. But in the natural environment, Lake Okeechobee served as a basin where the water would kind of stockpile during the rainy season. And when it reached a certain point, it would flow over the natural levee that existed along the southern edge of Lake Okeechobee, and it would move southward in this river of grass. And the upper part of the ecosystem were sawgrass plains. And as you move farther south, it became ridge and slough. And a ridge and slough environment is kind of deeper water channels separated by these tree islands, which are showing up as the little green dots. And there were two main conduits for the water, the Shark River Slough, which came out around Cape Sable, 
and then the Taylor Slough came east of the Pine Rocklands. The Rocklands are that eight foot high in the Everglades. And so they would come east of the Rocklands and out into the central and northeastern Florida Bay through that stretch there. And these are still the same two main conduits of water, Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough. But we're going to see how they've been impacted in a few minutes. In this schematic, um, the arrows, the, sort of the density and length of the arrows shows the velocity of flow. So as you move southward, flow sort of logically increased as the water piled up and moved out primarily through Shark River Slough, but a little bit through Taylor Slough. So let's just go through sort of a brief history of how we got to the point we're at today. Beginning in the early 1900s, um, Governor Broward actually campaigned on um, a position of draining the nasty swamp. And there was a lot of severe flooding in South Florida. People were starting to look at South Florida as a good place to live. So they created the Everglades Drainage District. And then from 1907 to 1930, that's when they began to alter the natural flow. And you can kind of see the progression of some of the channels and canals that are being built on these little schematics off to the side. But four main canals were constructed that linked Lake Okeechobee to the Atlantic Ocean during this time period. They built the dike along the southern edge of Lake Okeechobee to hold the water back. And they completed the Tamiami Trail, which links Miami to Naples. And um, if anybody's ever crossed South Florida, you've probably been on the Tamiami Trail. Then in 1935, um, partly due to Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, there was environmental concerns beginning. And they established the Everglades as a tropical preserve. And then in 1947, it officially became a national park. And that, coincidentally, is the same year the River of Grass was published. But in the late 1940s and even extending into the 50s, there were some very severe hurricanes and that caused severe flooding, uh, loss of land, loss of life. So the Army Corps of Engineers came in and this led to the passage of the Central and Southern Florida Project for Flood Control and Other Purposes. And that led to massive canal construction, um, which continued into the 60s. So there were construction of all kinds of levees. The Ever Everglades Agricultural Area was established, the water conservation areas. And the water conservation areas were put in just southeast and south of the agricultural area, the concept being that the water coming off of the Everglades Agricultural Area would contain fertilizer and other things that they didn't want entering the main system. So those conservation areas were put there to kind of hold as holding ponds so things could settle out. But the result was, quote, the most elaborate and effective water management system in the world. And I have been in the South Florida Water Management District Control Center. I've never been to NASA's control center in Houston, but something tells me they look an awful lot alike. I mean, it's just massive banks of computers controlling every, every levee, every gate in South Florida. Um, and they literally keep, you know, they, they want to know where virtually every gallon, they tell me, of water is going. So the 1970s to the 1990s, environmental concerns started kicking back up again. And in the 80s, there was a combination of droughts and floods that were kind of on the high ends of the spectrums for both. And this led to the declaration of an environmental emergency by the Park Service. And in 1984, the Save Our Everglades initiative began in South Florida with a group of local citizens. Then in 87 and 88, there was a massive die-off of seagrass in Florida Bay. And it's kind of interesting to me that it was this die-off in the estuaries of the Everglades that is what really prompted the current restoration effort. Um, a number of scientists were pulled into that activity, including some USGS scientists, to look at what was causing those die-offs. And that started focusing a lot of scientific attention, which focused management attention. And ultimately, in 1989, this led to the Everglades National Park Protection and Expansion Act and the formation of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. And that task force was responsible for drafting the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, as those of us that work down there call it. And that was um, authorized by Congress in 2000. So that's where we are today. 
And this kind of, again, to sort of dramatically show the differences, you know, we have a highly compartmentalized system today compared to what the natural system was like. And part of restoration, we know that we are not going to get rid of the Everglades agricultural area. We're obviously not going to get rid of the population of South Florida. We still have to be concerned about flooding water for both agriculture, the people, and the environment. And this is just sort of one more look at how dramatically the flow has been reduced today compared to what it was historically. So this is actually a loss of over 50% of the natural ecosystem. So when we're talking about restoring, we've already lost 50% of the natural system. So the question is, what can we do for what's left? And I want to come back to Marjorie Stoneham Douglas's words here because she had it right. Water is the meaning and the central fact of the Everglades of Florida. That's, that's been acknowledged from the very beginning and the foundation of SERP. Um, pretty much everyone who's been down there understands that the water is the key. So the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan is the framework that's there to guide the restoration, protection, and preservation of the water resources of central and southern Florida. It also deals with the Kissimmee River upstream, which you can see in this image here. And it's considered the world's largest ecosystem restoration effort, and it includes more than 60 sort of project components. And what's interesting in the Everglades restoration system is that each of these components, each of these projects, are made up of teams of people that include management and scientists. It includes engineers from the Army Corps of Engineers um, so, and, and modelers. So each team has at least one person from Army Corps of Engineers, one person from Department of Interior, and one person from South Florida Water Management District that co-lead each of these teams. So three people that head it from the three major agencies involved. And then a number of scientists and managers sit on each of these panels. And personally, I think this is a tremendous benefit because we're all in the room together at every meeting from the very beginning talking about what will make this work. And it's not a case of the scientists running off and we do our thing and we present the data and say, here, isn't this great? Now you're going to use it, right? And they don't know what to do with it. So we're sitting in the room at the same time figuring out what's needed. And I'll, I'll give a specific example shortly. So just to come back, so the goal of SERP overall is the restoration of rest, sorry, the goal of restoration is the recovery and sustainability of the defining characteristics of the greater Everglades ecosystem. And pretty much everyone is in agreement that that defining, the number one defining characteristic is the water. And that if we can get the water right, that's a phrase you hear a lot in South Florida, which means restoring the natural flow as best we can in a system with a 50% reduction already. And it means looking at the timing, delivery, quantity, and quality of that water delivery. It's not just a matter of pushing more water downstream. If you push more water downstream but it's polluted, you haven't helped anything. So the, the general plan, the thinking of the general plan, is that if we can get the water right, then the habitats, for the most part, will come back naturally. There will be some cases where we have to go in and remove invasives and that sort of thing. But in general, you'll get your habitats back. And then if you can get the habitats back, then the species will come back. So what is the science that's needed to accomplish those steps? Well, we need to understand the current conditions. What's going on out there now? How do the living species function? How do they interact with their habitats? What are the previous conditions? And what are the causes of change? How did we get from where we were at the beginning of the 20th century to today? What were some of the major impacts? And I'm primarily going to focus in this talk on the science behind determining the previous condition and how we use that information. So one more way of looking at this. We know what the current system looks like, the current flow. And we have a general idea of what the historic flow would have been like. So one of the questions we need to ask is what changes occurred when and at what rates? How fast was that change throughout the 20th century? And then we have a general idea of where we want to go. Again, it's a 50% reduced system, so we have to deal with that. But we need to figure out, can we set realistic targets for restoration 
And can we predict how the animals, the plants, the habitats are going to respond as we begin to implement restoration. And then we also have to deal with things like climate change and sea level rise. So can we predict how everything is going to respond to all of those changes as we move forward through a, at least a 50-year restoration period? So if water is the defining characteristic of the ecosystem, as we've hopefully established it is, but we've lost 50% of that original ecosystem. The big question for restoration is then how can we determine what the hydrologic functioning of the system was prior to alteration, when at best all you have are some anecdotal um, information, anecdotal comments, journals from people who wandered out into the Everglades around the beginning of the 20th century. And this is where the paleoecology comes in. Um, by looking at the record of things in the sediments, we can tell how things have changed over time. So we go out into the environment, we collect these cores, we analyze all the plant and animal remains that we can, that we find in the cores. We establish age models for the cores, because if you don't know that something was pre-1900, it doesn't really help that you figure out what lived there. And then we pretty much analyze everything that we can in the cores. We look at geochemistry, biogeochemistry, grain size. We try to get every clue out of those sediments that we possibly can. And there is a lot of information that can be derived from any paleoecological investigations, not just what we're doing in South Florida. But we can look at changes in ecosystem drivers. What are the things that are pushing the system? Climate and storm history, sea level rise, changes to water management and land use alterations. But we can also look at very specific aspects of an ecosystem by studying the paleoecology. We can look at salinity and fresh water flow, biodiversity, um, water quality, nutrients and oxygen, the habitats, and the invasive species. We can even look and see like when did an invasive actually enter an ecosystem and what impact did it have? Did it immediately affect the percent of other species present? Um, and did it cause die-offs? What were the, the actions? But today I'm primarily going to focus on salinity and freshwater flow and water management practices. So our ecosystem history projects, and there's a number of them, not just what I'm going to be presenting today. My work has been focused on the estuaries, but I have colleagues, Deb Willard and Christopher Bernhardt, who have done in the freshwater wetlands what I'm doing in the estuaries. But for our specific projects, we've looked at estimating the pre-1900 salinity patterns in those estuaries. That was our number one goal. Then we were hoping that we could use that salinity in the estuaries to tell us something about the historic flow and stage in the wetlands of the Everglades prior to significant alteration. And then ultimately our goal was to then provide these data to the managers that are responsible for setting targets and performance measures for restoration to try to see if they can use the, these data. So the estuaries are very important in the system. They're kind of, I call them the canaries in the coal mine because they are the transition zone, especially along this northern margin of Florida Bay here, the shoreline of Biscayne Bay and these rivers in the southwest coast. They're transitioning between this completely freshwater marsh up here and the completely marine environment of the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast along the Keys. So by looking at changes in the salinity in Florida Bay, we can say something about how much fresh water was entering those estuaries. And our method is really simple. The, the present is the key to the past. So we go out, and this little cartoon kind of shows that we go out, we, in the modern environment, we sample what's there, we make observations, we record data about salinity, water depth, habitats. And um, we bring the samples back to the labs, analyze them, and determine what's present. So then we have data about living species. Then when we collect our core, we sample the core, split it up, look at it. And if we find the same animals in the core that we found in the modern environment, we can make the assumption that they lived in the same way. So if we know that an animal lives in low salinity water today, we can make the assumption that it did 100 years ago. Now that's the basic premise of all paleoecology, whether you're looking back 100 years, 1,000 years, a million, or 100 million years. Everybody, every paleoecologist operates under this assumption. 
But what's very nice about what we're doing here is that we are sampling in Florida Bay for our modern species and we're analyzing cores from Florida Bay. And we're only looking back 100 to maybe 500 years. So all of the species are still alive. So in other words, it's a rather safe assumption that the environmental constraints or requirements of those animals haven't changed that much in that time period. So we've collected a number of cores in the South Florida environment. The red are from Biscayne Bay, the yellow from Florida Bay, and the white from the southwest coast of Cape Sable area. We've collected over 77 cores from 43 different locations, and to date we've analyzed 23 of them in a fair amount of detail. And then to establish the age models, because if we don't know where that pre-anthropogenic influence is, the pre-1900 time period, it doesn't do us a lot of good to look at the changes. So we try for all the cores where it's possible to use carbon-14 dating, lead-210 dating, and then the first occurrence of Australian pine. And whenever I give this talk, I always say, well, there's one benefit to paleoecologists of invasive or exotic species, because they can often serve as great biomarkers in the sediments. We know that this species was introduced into South Florida as a windbreak for the storms. It's a very fast-growing pine, and it was introduced right around the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century. So, and it's a wind-borne pine pollen, so we see it spreading all across the South Florida environment very quickly. It makes a great marker in the cores. So it allows us to key in on this beginning of the 20th century, and then we want to analyze the portion of the core just prior to that to try to see what the system was like. So the other part of this, the present is the key to the past. We have to understand that modern environment. So we have a number of modern locations scattered throughout Florida Bay, uh, Biscayne Bay, and the southwest coast where we sample things. And we try to gather as much information as we can. Our number one focus is the salinity of these animals, but we also look at you know, how do they live, what's the substrate they prefer, what's the water depth. That helps us when we see a change in the core decide whether it's the salinity that's changing or maybe these animals live on seagrass and the seagrass disappeared. So we have to kind of tweak those things apart. We've compiled a massive data set that if anybody's interested in it, they can go online and see it. And we've, we have over, over 178 modern sites that we go back to periodically. And so we've had over 800 site visits since 1995. And we found 180 mollusk species alive. And that's what I focus on. And that's the data I'm showing you today are mollusks. But I have colleagues who work on ostracods and forams and diatoms. So we, as I said earlier, we use every piece of information we can out of the course. And you'll see several of these plots. So let me get you oriented. Um, this is how paleoecologists sort of look at changes over time. So this is the core. So think of this as the modern day surface up here. And as we go down, we're going farther back in time. Um, this particular core was 140 centimeters deep. And then we just plot up changes in specific species or groups of species over time. So it's very easy for anybody to just look at this quickly and see that these things existed in the older part of the core and they're completely absent from the upper part of the core, whereas these things start becoming more abundant in the upper part of the core. And so we'll, we'll look at a few of these in more detail in a minute. When we started, our hypotheses were that when we would collect the near shore cores, the things up where the fresh water is flowing out of the Everglades, that we would most likely find that the salinities were much lower when we got back to prior to the water management construction of the canals and all of that, prior to the alteration of natural flow. And that as we moved closer and closer to the Gulf Coast out here, that then we wouldn't see as much of an effect, that the open water was open water back then, and so that kind of moderates those effects from the fresh water flowing out. So those were the hypotheses we started with at the beginning of this project. So now let's look at a couple of these cores a little bit closer. This is Taylor Creek Core, which is right at the mouth of that Taylor Slough, which I showed you earlier is one of the two main conduits of water coming into um, the estuaries of South Florida. So it's located right there at the margin, 
This is the approximately 1900 timeline in the core. And as you go from left to right, basically you're increasing salinity, although when you get to this sort of olive green color, it means things that can tolerate a 40 part per thousand change in salinity, which is a lot. Um, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with salinity, marine normal marine salinity is 35 parts per thousand. Freshwater is zero parts per thousand. So estuaries typically have this whole range from zero to 35 parts per thousand. Um, and so we can see that as we go in this direction in general, we're losing these low salinity organisms and we're increasing the things that can tolerate the fluctuating salinity. But we also have a distinctive decline in the purely freshwater snails that are floating out with the freshwater flow. And, but that decline begins before the 19th century. So some of that may be due to sea level rise. And just let's look at one more similar thing this one is from Crocodile Point. So this is now a little bit offshore, but we see the same thing, the loss of the low salinity to freshwater organisms that are present at the bottom of the core. As it gets closer and closer to the modern environment, we lose them and we get a large increase in these things that can tolerate the wide ranges in salinity. And with what, what water management has done has it's taken away that natural flow, because when we think back to what I said at the beginning, water builds up in Lake Okeechobee and it flows southward. And that flow was pretty much continuous through the wet and the dry season. I mean, you would the, the flow would reduce during the dry season, but it wouldn't stop entirely. So there was always some supply of fresh water coming into the estuaries. In the controlled environment, there were times when literally the water was shut off, the doors were closed, the water was saved upstream for agriculture and for water for the urban environment. Now in recent years, they've been moderating that. They never have complete shutdowns. But the alternative is when the hurricanes come in, they open everything, so then you have these tremendous flushes of fresh water. So that's why we see in the estuaries over time, in the later part of the 20th century, the, this predominance of critters that can tolerate these wide swings from, you know, it, it's just a tremendous amount of fresh water coming in to it's almost drying up. And another way to look at this is if we kind of look, this is like a transect from southern Biscayne Bay over to Whitewater Bay. So these are the cores, they're, they're not spread out geographically here. And if we look at the bottom of the cores, some of the cores went back to almost 2,000 years. And the bottoms of the cores were fresh water and low salinity things. And for over, for almost 2,000 years, we're seeing just gradual increasing in salinity as we move up. Then we hit 1900, and in 100 years, the entire system changes to these things that can tolerate the wide ranges of salinity. And we can also look at this spatially. So that was sort of a, a temporal or time look. We can look at it from map view. If we go back 2,000 years, the fresh water extended out about this far. And I, I should put a line on here. The modern fresh water at best comes like this. And um, very low salinities near shore. Right at the turn of the century, we had a very typical estuarine zonation with very low salinities up around the margins and increasing salinity as you move out in the bays. And the reason these are spotty is because I don't have cores from everywhere out there that have been analyzed yet. And then here again is another look. We have this olive green color for those species that can tolerate pretty much any salinity and they're taking over the whole bay. We've lost that typical estuarine zonation. And when you kind of line them all up side by side, you can see that it, it took 1900 years to go from this to this, and then just 100 years to go from this to this. So pretty dramatic changes. So we've accomplished our first goal. We've estimated the pre-1900 salinity patterns in the estuaries. So then the next thing is, but how can we get the management to use this to help estimate flow and stage? Or what can we do to try to estimate that? 
Um, I, had, I kept presenting my data at these meetings with the scientists and the managers and the engineers, and they'd all say, well, that's very interesting that you can show how the salinity changed like that. But we need actual numbers to plug into the models. And pretty much every part of the system out there, this is just Florida Bay. It's divided up into all these little zones. The management groups have to have performance measures and targets for every single one of those basins. So how are they going to do that? And then upstream, they have to come up with targets for freshwater flow and salinity. But one of the problems is that they use these theoretically based models. I call them the black box models, where tons of information goes in and the supercomputers crank out the data. And uh, they use the natural system model, the South Florida Water Management District and the Army Corps does. It works pretty well in the wetlands at predicting what they think the salinity or the, the, the water depth and flow should be, but it does not work in the estuaries. Those models were having full strength marine salinity all the way up at the boundary in a restored system, which we know both from the paleo data and the anecdotal data is not the way the system worked. So the solution. I told you that there was a benefit for all of us sitting in the same room, the managers, the scientists, the modelers, the engineers. I was presenting to the Southern Coastal System Group my latest um, method that I'd come up with for calculating an average salinity value, which I'll show you very briefly in a minute. And my colleague, Frank Marshall, was presenting his piece of data that he had just come up with. He developed equations where he used all of the stage data, that there are these stations that exist out in the Everglades today, hydrologic stations. And he used all of that information, put it into you know, a program, and was able to calculate what the salinity is out in Florida Bay based on the stage and the flow in the freshwater wetlands. So he had these equations that did that in the modern environment, 100% modern data, and I had my paleo data and one of our colleagues from Fish and Wildlife Federation said, well, Frank, you have a term for salinity in your equations, and Lynn is calculating paleo salinity. If we plug the paleo salinity number into that salinity equation, can we back calculate stage and flow? And the answer was yes. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through how we do that. So same process, we ga I gather all the same modern data. Um, but the focus here is on looking at the mean salinity. And I'll show you why in a minute. So this, these are my lists of modern species. And we have all kinds of data that we collect on them. But the mean is the thing that we focus on. So for every species we've ever seen alive, what is its average salinity? Then we took five cores out in Florida Bay. And I developed this value. So we've seen this plot of Taylor Creek core before with this part of the diagram. But this wasn't there. And this is a number that averages the salinity that takes into account all the species that are present, their preferred salinity in the modern environment, and how abundant they were. And I'm going to show you one equation. I promise it's just one. <laughs> um, so this is that number that you just saw plotted. We call it the cumulative weighted percent. It's a mouthful, but it's the cumulative weighted percent salinity. And to calculate it, what we do is we take the percent abundance of a single species. So this particular species, 28% abundance. We multiply that by the average salinity of the living animal. Do that for each species present in a core sample, add it up across the column and divide by 100, and that gives us our cumulative average salinity. So this is a statistically valid number. Oops, and I just pushed, OK, I did the thing I wasn't supposed to do. <laughs> just continue, thank you. OK. Um, so, no, OK. How do I? Sorry, folks. He warned me, what, do I push the button back here again? Or do I, can I go, I can go to here. I think I got it. I did, okay. Let me click us back to where we were. Um, I think we can actually go ahead and move on. Yes, so this, this is what we plot, this average value. 
and the modelers like this because I have confidence levels and standard deviations and everything associated with that number. So they like that a lot better than me coming back and saying, oh, there were a lot of freshwater things living there. Okay, that was interesting to them. This they can use. So we focus on the part of the core that's right around 1900, which we know from our pollen and our lead 210 and our carbon dating. And then we take that piece, and I'll show you that in a second, but I want to digress just for a minute. If we just take that number, when I calculate that for each of the cores, and we compare it to the modern station data, the average modern station data, there is a difference of at least seven parts per thousand average over all of these five sites. So in the past, the salinity was at least seven parts per thousand less than it is in the modern environment. So then we develop a paleo salinity time series for each of these things. And this is where Frank steps in, but he takes that natural system model that I said before doesn't work very well. But the natural system model is based on real climate data. So when they plugged all that information into their black box, they would look at, well, if we have a really rainy year, then we're going to have lower salinities. And if we have really dry years, we're going to have higher salinities. So it's real climate data that goes into that. And then we take this difference. So this is the difference for this particular core, the uh, Rankin Lake core, between my estimate and what the natural system model says it should be. So this is our way of correcting the natural system model. Basically, we just go in, and here's a detailed look at one year and just subtract that 2.1 from every one of the data points from the natural system model. And that adjusts it to bring that salinity down to what the paleo data say it should be. So that's how we get the time series. I'm not going to go into any more equations, but, but Frank's equations that relate the modern, we plug those two things together, and we're able to then calculate what the stage and the flow used to be in the historical Everglades. And let me show you some of those results. So the white is the paleo estimate up here for flow in uh, cubic meters per second, and down here in stage per meter. And at the Shark River Slough, the one big outflow that we talked about, you can see what a difference there is between the current system and the paleo estimate. The difference, the Taylor Slough has never had as much flow, um, but there's a significant difference between the paleo estimate and the current. And when we look at stage, again, stage was always higher. That's the water level, how high is the water, it's in a standing position. And what that means is that the flow through the historic Everglades had to be one and a half to two times greater um, in the past than it is in the present condition. So now we know how much more water we have to get down the system. And when we look at the salinity in uh, Florida Bay, we can see in every single case the estimated paleo salinity is less than the current system. And you'll notice that that value is less on the south and the west. And let me switch to the map view. Um, so the numbers are lowest out here on the west coast and highest up here along the transition zone and central Florida Bay. So this is the difference between the paleo and the modern. So in the paleo environment, this central part of Florida Bay was about nine parts per thousand salinity lower, or nine practical salinity units lower than it is today. Whereas out here, it's just a difference of about two to three. But if you remember back to our original hypotheses, we thought that that's exactly what we would find. We thought we would find a much bigger effect up here. We actually didn't expect to find much of an effect at all out on the West Coast. So the fact that we even see a difference out there really tells us how much water has been reduced. So to summarize our scientific findings, by integrating the paleo data, the observed data, and models, we found that Florida Bay was less saline, with the nearshore salinities being about seven to nine parts per thousand, or practical salinity units, we go back and forth between using those, less than um, today. And the salinity along the western margin was about three parts per thousand less. 
The flow in the Everglades was about one and a half to two times greater than it is today, and the stage in the wetlands was about a quarter of a meter higher in the past than it is today. So these results are being used by the Southern Coastal Systems team to develop their performance measures and targets for salinity in the estuaries. And if you feel like it, you can go and read their whole report. In 2012, they did um, the system status report updates. And these are required by the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Every so often, we have to do these system status updates. But they did one on salinity, and this report incorporated all of the numbers that we were producing for salinity. So those numbers are now the targets for salinity. And I apologize, this did not uh, screen copy very well. I snagged this off the um, Everglades plan site. But what they're doing is kind of an interesting system, too, and I think more and more places are adapting this, the stoplight approach. They figure everybody can look at a chart a stoplight chart and know that red is bad and green is good and yellow is eh. <laughs> So if we look here, they, they used our um, salinity estimates to establish for each basin and each place in Florida Bay what the salinity should be. And so then for June of 2012, they went through as kind of an exercise to see how this would work. And in the dry season, the North Bay region was completely red. And in the wet season, it was completely green. So in other words, in the wet season, they were meeting all of the requirements. They're still not meeting it for the dry season. And in general, when you look at the chart, the dry season's red and yellow, whereas most of the wet season is green to yellow. There's a little bit of red down there on the bottom in the east central basin. So we've met all three of our goals. We have been able to tell them what the salinity used to look like. We've been able to use that information to estimate stage and flow, and they're actually using our data, which as a scientist is a great feeling. <laughs> um, so before I let you go, I want to just leave you with a philosophical question. What do we really mean by restoration? I think a lot of people have the concept that restoration means returning to some point in the past. And paleoecologic data is great at detecting trends. In this particular core, we see that we had this kind of general trend moving along prior to 1900, and then we see this offset in the 20th century. All right, so we, we can see this overall, and this is actually, I said this core, this is a generalized core from several cores, I included the data. So does restoration mean returning to this past unaltered system? And the answer is absolutely no. We can't do that. We will never achieve restoration if that's what we want to do. Because if human beings had never set foot in South Florida, the ecosystem was on a trajectory of change. All ecosystems are going through their own trajectories of change completely without us. They are not static systems. So we can't try to aim for something in the past. But the paleo data helps us understand what these trends are and these trajectories. So what restoration should be about is getting us back on track to what that natural ecosystem trajectory was. However, it's a little bit complicated when we start talking about sea level rise. I love this schematic that was put together by NPS, um, Climate Change and South Florida's National Parks. And a guy at University of Miami put this um, simulated two foot rise in sea level. And you can see this is that coastline that I was showing you all along the northern margin of Florida Bay. And now that margin is up here with a two foot rise. So we need to develop various scenarios and understand what these some of these different possibilities are and develop targets for each of those scenarios. And then as restoration proceeds and as we see what sea level is doing, we adapt to what that new target might be. But we're not trying to go backward in time. So I come back to the title, Understanding the Past, I believe, is the key to the future. And not just for Everglades restoration, but for many locations around the country and around the world. Because it allows us to understand changes that have taken place on ecosystem scale levels over time periods that are significant to ecosystems. We can look at changes in drivers and changes in specific attributes of those ecosystems. 
So thank you very much. And I think I have time for questions. Is that right, Diana?